Hey guys, so this is a continuation of chapter 16. We're going to be talking about the Great Plains again. So remember, more or less, these are the Rocky Mountains. They go from Canada all the way to Mexico. And over here, we have the Mississippi River that runs north to south. This area in between here is called the Great Plains. In the 1870s to the 1890s, as white settlers come into the Great Plains, we have a conflict that becomes known as the Indian Wars. So it's a conflict between Native Americans in the Great Plains and settlers. There were some Native Americans who were forced to go to reservations, other ones refused to go, and some who were already le there left the reservations because they were living under unbearable condition. So as these white settlers come in here, we have all these conflicts that take place and what becomes known to the white man's perspective as the Indian problem. Reformers started to call it a white problem, so there was conflict even among whites. Reformers felt that Native Americans were well behaved and that they could be just as white as anybody else. Now this was well intentioned, but reformers sought to eliminate native language, culture, and religion. And that is what becomes known as kill the Indian, not the men. So in other words, eliminate the heritage of the Native Americans. So we had already have problems with African Americans down here in the South. The US refused to protect it during reconstruction. In California, the Chinese were considered heathens and now whites, some whites, sought to exterminate Native Americans. So it seems like in social, in terms of social issues, the government has very many issues with anybody who is not white. So all this leads to major conflict. The first one that we're gonna be talking about is called either the Gray Sioux Uprising or it's also called the Santee Uprising. It takes place in Minnesota, um, what becomes known as the Dakota Sioux. So right around here, that's where this type of conflict takes place. In 1851, the Sioux that had lived here, they signed a treaty with the native, with the U.S. government and what becomes known as the, the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux and Mendota. In the treaty, the Sioux had agreed to surrender 21 million acres of land in exchange for $3.17 million. Unfortunately, the U.S. government kept 80% of that money. When the Native American protested, their protest fought to deaf ears. The Sioux did occupy a small piece of land, but after a few years, they were in dire of provisions. So in 1862, tired of being ignored and on the verge of starvation, the Sioux attacked, killing immigrants and farmers in the area that is located on the map here. The U.S. Army was sent to stop the massacres, and they were able to stop the Sioux at Fort Ridgely. At the end of it, over 400 Sioux were tried, 303 were sentenced, most of them were pardoned by Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, but 38 were hanged in the largest execution in U.S. history. All other remaining Sioux were either sent to reservations or imprisoned in Iowa. This took place in 1862, the same year that Lincoln was drafting the Emancipation Proclamation, the same year that Congress passed the Homestead Act. The effect of this conflict was that Congress canceled all treaties with the Dakota Sioux, they revoked all the remaining money that they were supposed to pay. They kicked out all the remaining Sioux from Minnesota. And this set the stage for further conflict between the Great Plains Natives and the federal government. Now, we see other tribes here, the Cheyenne, they're living here. They were allies with the Sioux. And so there was an increase of fear that those Cheyenne were also going to start an uprising. And that leads us to our second event between the conflict between Native Americans and the U.S. government, it takes place right here in Colorado and becomes known as the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864. So this took place in 1862, the Santee Uprising. Now we're down here in Colorado. So the individual here involved is John Chivington. She was seeking glory and he used the fears of whites against the Cheyenne to crush the Native Americans. On May 1864, the Cheyenne chief Black Kettle had agreed to settle along the Sand Creek until a treaty was reached to determine what was going to happen with the Sioux that were roaming the Great Plains. Before the treaty was signed, on November 29, 1864, Chivington attacked a Cheyenne camp when most men were out hunting. In his attack, in his attack he killed over 100 native Cheyenne women and children. It seemed like, to some whites, that the savages and the uncivilized peoples were not the Native Americans, rather, whites like Chivington who was out there massacring innocent women and children.
The reason Native Americans, the reason Native Americans fell victim to some settlers was because whites believed that natives were an impediment to civilization and progress. And so as white were, were moving west, then Native Americans needed to be exterminated. The next conflict that we're going to be talking about actually goes in favor of the Native Americans. This becomes known as the Fetterman Massacre, and it takes place in Wyoming. So right around here. And it includes the Bosman Trail. So the Bosman Trail was used by civilians traveling to Montana in search of gold. The people, the travelers were using the Bosman Trail to get there, and the U.S. Army was sent to protect these settlers. Now, the Lakota Sioux, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho attacked these settlers because they were, in essence, going through their land and confiscating their resources. Eventually, Captain William Judd Fetterman, who becomes known as the Fetterman Massacre, the victim of the Fetterman Massacre, he attacked the Native Americans, but he undermined them. He only took 80 troops and attacked 2,000 Sioux. It was a lopsided battle. The Native Americans killed Fetterman and his army, and the U.S federal government eventually closed the Bosman Trail to avoid further conflict. This sketch that you see here appear in Harper, Harper's Weekly, which shows the conflict between the Native Americans here and some U.S. settlers and army. Next major event that we're going to be talking about is the Battle of Little Bighorn. The Battle of Little Bighorn takes place in southern Montana, right around there. So the Battle of Little Bighorn involves George Armstrong Custer, again, another individual in search of gold and glory. So it involves the Lakota Sioux, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho. In 1868, the U.S. government has signed a treaty, the Sioux Treaty of 1868, whereas the U.S. will recognize the Black Hills as part of the Great Sioux Reservation for exclusive use of the Sioux. The Sioux were the only ones that were going to be allowed to use that land. Now, the Native Americans continue to haunt that land as if that was their own, which was true. However, in 1876, Custer and his men were seeking gold, and that should say gold, were seeking gold in the Black Hills. And when they said that gold was found, they ordered the Sioux to leave. Sitting Bull, leader of the Sioux, prepared for conflict instead of leaving the land. So on June 26, 1876, nearly 100 years after U.S.'s independence and declaring that all men were created equal, Custer sends an attack against the Sioux. He takes 200 and about 70 men to attack the Sioux. However, again, like Chivington, he undermined the, the power of the Sioux. Custer's men were completely annihilated. The, this was the biggest successful victory by any Native American group against the U.S. Army. All 277 of Custer's men were killed. And whites were appalled by the massacre of Native Americans. They were appalled when Native Americans defeated the U.S. Army, but they were not appalled when people like Chivington killed the Native Americans in the Sand Creek Massacre. So, whites asked for retaliation. And in 1877, a year later, the U.S. Army went back to Little Bighorn and confiscated all the land that they had promised to protect only 10 years earlier. This sketch here kind of shows you the beginning of the Battle of Little Bighorn. That is General Custer. And these are all the Native Americans who launched a very, very well-trained attack against the U.S. Army. The next and final battle that we're going to be talking about is Wounded Knee. Wounded Knee takes place in South Dakota. And about a year earlier, that was when Sitting Bull was killed in 1889. Wounded Knee takes place in 1890. It is a battle between the Sioux and the 7th U.S. Cavalry, and this picture right here shows you the beginning of it. So on the forefront here, you see the American army, and on the back, you see the Sioux trying to defend themselves. So this takes place over a religious ceremony. The conflict takes place over a religious ceremony that, for the Native Americans, is known as the Sun Dance. So it was a sacred dance to bring back the bison to help Native Americans occupy their ancestral land and to drive whites back from the land that was once Native American land. Now, the whites consider the sun dance a ghost dance. They consider it as an insurrection because according to them, the ghost dance was preaching death to all whites. So, we have the conflict here. The Lakota Native Americans fled the reservation that they were in to practice the sun dance. The army freaks out 
They confiscate weapons, uh, fearing that Native Americans were going to start, start an insurrection. And as they were confiscating these weapons, a skirmish broke out and then havoc ensued. The U.S. Army indiscriminately fired upon unarmed men. They fired upon women who, instead of carrying weapons, were carrying their children. They opened fire wet cannons on the elderly as if they were fighting a well-equipped army. It was completely the opposite. The Native Americans were not shooting at the army. When the smoke cleared, snow descended and over 200 Native Americans lay dead in the frozen ground. Wounded Knee marked the last battle of these Indian wars. After Wounded Knee, most Native Americans were placed in reservations. Their land had been confiscated and their culture nearly torn apart. And what they faced was an uncertain future that, for, in a land that they once called home. There was other conflict that we did not talk about. The Nez Perce here in Idaho, they were forced, their leader, Chief Joseph, was trying to leave into Canada to avoid being sent to reservations. But unfortunately, right before they reached Canada, the U.S. Army captured them and sent them to a reservation. There was another conflict that took place that was major down here. The picture is covering it. But in Arizona, between the U.S. Army and the Apache, their leader was Geronimo. Also, same thing happened. Geronimo was captured and the Apache were also sent to reservations. But Wounded Knee in 1890 marked the last battle of what becomes known as the Indian Wars. So now that these Native Americans are in reservations, they try to do everything to conserve at minimum their culture. This is a map that we've been seeing in all these lights. All this land was once Native American land. And the key kind of helps us understand the land that was surrendered by Native Americans in the particular year. So all this land in yellow was confiscated by Native Americans by 18, before 1850. All the land in green was confiscated by Native Americans between 1850 and 1870. It was surrendered by Native Americans. The land in pink, it was surrendered by Native Americans between 1870 and 1890. So by 1890, the only land that is left by Native Americans is this land. These patches of land are in blue or purple, if you will. Not very many. The land had been confiscated. So the only thing that was left for them was to keep their culture. And so the elderly people try to pass their native language, stories, and traditions to the younger generations. A big thing that they were able to conserve was their art-making abilities and their medicine. There were missionaries that were sent to these reservations to try to Christianize Native Americans. Native Americans also refused to Christianize, and that was a form of keeping their culture alive. Now, right before the Indian Wars ended in 1887, we have the Dos Severity Act that was passed. Severity means the sole ownership of land or individual ownership. The author of the Dos Severity Act was Senator Henry Dos of Massachusetts. He had hoped to divide Indian land or reservations into 160 acres of individual land, which was a strange offer for Native Americans because they were not used to having private ownership. They were used to having communal land. Now, the land that was given to some Native Americans was infertile. Other land that was fertile was later confiscated by homesteaders coming west. Two years after the Dawes Severity Act in 1889, this land here that is Oklahoma, that land had been reserved for Native Americans. And again, the federal government promised that that land was never going to be touched by nobody else other than Native Americans. Well, in 1889, Oklahoma is open for settlement and what becomes known as the Oklahoma Land Rush. That land had been set aside for Native Americans, but now whites took it over as well. So a year later in 1890, we have a historian, Frederick Jackson Turner. He argued that the Western frontier was now close for settlement because all the land that could possibly be occupied was occupied by white settlers. Little did he know that less than 10 years later, the American government would take over overseas empires like the Philippines and Cuba, and the American expansion was only the beginning. It was only starting its beginning here.